Hey, listen, a little bit of a constitutional exam tonight for you. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome in. Nice to have you. You're watching this on Friday night, October 5th, most likely. This is a program that we, it's brand new, the show, but it was recorded last week, middle of last week, with our esteemed guest, uh, Corey Brettschneider, professor at Brown University and constitutional scholar, who's written a new book, which I'll show you in a second. First, I want to read a part of it to you, uh, and it goes like this. You want to serve your country. You aspire to run for office and not just any office. You want to be president of the United States. If you succeed, you'll control the most advanced technology ever conceived, much of it secret. You'll be able to authorize missile strikes, negotiate treaties, and spy on people around the world. And with a vast payroll, you'll now run the largest employer in the country, the federal government. For a moment, you say you won. Uh, you might hope to use this power to achieve great things, such as ending poverty, providing affordable health care, or eliminating violent crime. You'll have the ability to influence legislation and shape decisions about how to use the enormous federal budget. Lives, jobs, and trillions of dollars hang in the balance, and you have the ability to tip it. As you wave to your inauguration crowd through a blizzard of confetti, nothing seems out of reach. Be careful. I thought that was a great opening. Here's the book. You should get it on Amazon and the Brown Bookstore and Barnes and & Noble and anywhere else where you can find great books. I thought that was such a great open to this conversation. Welcome, my friend. Thank nice you. To have Thanks you. so much. Pleasure and, to be here. And again, we taped the show on Tuesday of last week, a day and a half prior to what was the scheduled uh, hearing for uh, Justice Kavanaugh. Who knows on this Friday what might have happened by then, but the broader conversation I think that you discuss in this book I think is wholly appropriate to anything hypothetical or, or real, including Rod Rosenstein, who may or may not be employed at this time as people are seeing this show for the first time. And my guess is, uh, based on our broadcast schedules, that you're, probably, you're going to see the show on a number of occasions because there are broader concepts here um, to talk about. You, you're, you're a constitutional scholar, you teach this stuff, you wrote this book, why? Uh, part of it uh, is uh, getting out of the day-to-day -day, uh, grit of the news. It's partly about this current president, and as I say in the acknowledgments, uh, the two of us did a series of shows, both on this program and on the radio, when Donald Trump was running for office. And what that prompted me to do was to think about the ways in which that candidate was proposing to violate the Constitution uh, when it came, for instance, to his uh, threat to change the libel laws or his claim that uh, the families of suspected terrorists should be tortured uh, or the proposed Muslim ban, which of course uh, became a reality later on, uh, that all those added up to a deep thing, which is a lack of understanding of Article II and the idea of the presidency that's laid out in the Constitution. The president is charged with taking an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that's what this book is about, I the have, broader idea. I have to laugh. Um, I, I don't know whether it's happened before where I've had a compelling guest on any one of the thousands of shows that I've done where I say, you really need to write a book about this. <laughs> and they did. Uh, I'm not taking exclusive responsibility for the motivation, but you really were, and we have been, in a very tumultuous time. Yeah. And it was a situation where uh, news event after news event, over the many times that you've done the show, we, we be applying constitutional practice uh, and understanding to it. So obviously this was boiling up in you. For those who are looking at the show right away going, okay, <laughs> I get it. This guy don't like Trump. <laughs> so now... We're going to write a constitutional analysis to satisfy you don't like Trump. Your answer is? Well, I think we have to be honest that you and I began these conversations by talking about these myriad of proposals in the way that they were antithetical to the Constitution. But it wasn't a partisan discussion. We were talking about the Constitution. And the ambition of the book, especially, and the advice that I got after having those initial discussions, was that the way to do it wasn't to focus on one president, which this certainly doesn't, uh, but to focus on the Constitution as a whole and the presidents uh, in general in the way that they have supported and defended the Constitution or in many instances.
instances opposed it. So it begins early on by talking about George Washington's second inaugural address, one of the shortest ever given, 135 words. And what did he say? He said, I just took the oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. But if I demean the office, if I violate my oath, then what the people before me need to do, and this was in a small room in Philadelphia, mostly uh, senators and Congress people, and what he said is, you have to subject me to upbraidings or criticism, and ultimately, if I don't listen, if I demean the office, subject me to constitutional punishment. So that's the idea, is going back to Washington, our first president, in many ways, our greatest when it came to a vision of what the office was about, and rehearsing, repeating, looking at those 135 words to see the meaning of the office there, that we've lost. There was an intimacy with the Constitution that George Washington had because he helped, or he, was, he, he was in the meeting, man. He was, he right. was presiding, right. just a few, not far away right. from where they wrote it. So they all came out with an understanding of what they had just done, perfected right. probably the best form of government we have on the planet, although it is imperfect. Of course, uh, yeah. But, I mean, there was a level of intimacy there that was intrinsic, it was born in. Yeah. You make a point that the first thing, and at least the minimum thing, that one must do if one decides to run for the presidency is to understand the Constitution. Read <laughs> to yeah. read it, know it, understand it. Uh, this I, president has no doubt tripped on it <laughs> more times, and even those who support him kind of go, "All right, he didn't get that one right." All right, but uh, but 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 the but 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 the wheels are off that way. There's no chance that he's ever read the Constitution. Yeah, I mean, I think he certainly read, as is required of every president, the words that are required by Article Two that I mentioned to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. But I don't think that he took it seriously or listened to it. You could see that from the speech, from the proposals. And, uh, you know, the idea of the presidency is not I was elected and I can do whatever I want and the law is something to get around, the things that this president focuses on. Uh, the idea is respect, respect for the American people and respect for the rule of law. But one of the things you also say, as I was able to read the introduction, you say, hey, listen, um, to preserve and protect doesn't mean to naturally want to test. Right. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and th that is a... That is a very, very, very different concept. You don't go into the presidency. Everybody wanted a change agent, a disruptor, somebody yeah. who looked at it differently. And, the, and you know, you know the, the system is broken and the deep state and all of that. All of the structure of America, although bloated now with federal governments that are huge and mm. uh, agencies rather that are huge and more money than God, uh, funding the whole thing. The the essence, though, of everything that that people have a problem with, are born from constitutional foundation. Yeah. So be careful what you ask for when you want a disruptor, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, you know, we have had disruptors before. I talk in the book, I'm critical of Woodrow Wilson, who really was a constitutional law professor at Princeton. He knew it very well. And uh, he uh, expanded the presidency quite uh, knowingly beyond the Washington idea. And he invented, I think Teddy Roosevelt invented the bully pulpit. He turned it into a constitutional ideal that could be used. But he, was, uh, he didn't do it well. I mean, he used uh, the office. Uh, he was quoted, for instance, in Birth of a Nation twice, a film about the glory of the supposed glory of the Ku Klux Klan. And rather than renounce that and do his constitutional duty to respect the idea of equality under the law regardless of race, the Equal Protection Clause, which he knew so well, was earned after the Civil War. Uh, what did he do? He celebrated Birth of a Nation. He showed it in the White House. So we have had presidents like Wilson who uh, abused the office and disrespected the Constitution. And as you say, the idea isn't just to do the minimum, not just to do what courts won't, uh, will, will enforce you, force you to do or not do. The idea of the presidency is you, to use these vast powers and we need to elect somebody who's going to not just respect the limits, but who's going to defend them in the sense of using the bully pulpit to defend the ideals of free speech, equal protection. Now, that failed with 
Wilson, and I guess I would say that the president's bully pulpit, which has just expanded with Twitter, where he doesn't have to go through a press office, he can speak directly to the American people. Through Twitter, the press tries to play catch up, and what his use of that to continue to really insult the ideal of equal protection or free speech or numerous ideals in the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment, uh, that is uh, Wilson gone mad. It's really a, an abuse of uh, presidential power and a disrespect for the Washingtonian idea that the presidency is constrained by the Constitution. All right, that's way too much to, to, to <laughs> say to, for a follow-up here. We'll do it in the next segment because I wonder whether the Constitution has the necessary flexibility to just adapt to technology and platform. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The book is The Oath and the Office by Corey Brettschneider. He is a professor at Brown University, constitutional scholar, political scientist, and uh, I haven't had a chance to, to read it in, in its entirety, but it's on the top. It's going to the top of my list. There's a couple, there are some, you know, everyday reading is my challenge. The, 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 other, the other stuff, so th this is gonna pop up because we need, I, I haven't gotten to uh, a Woodward's book yet. Uh, but I think this is going to go on top because this needs this needs to be done. People need to they need to understand their constitution. You know, you know, I'm a Catholic. Uh, so many of us don't even know why we take communion. Like basic understanding, foundational premises of whatever your organizational thing is, you just seem to be slipping away. Diligence, that kind of acumen. I bet you you've got bylaws in your Elks Club or whatever <laughs> that you don't really, you're, everybody seems to be operating so fast and so quick that they've forgotten some premises. And it, you know, if you're going to evaluate this presidency or any presidency, the current dramas that exist, knowing your constitutional A, Bs, yeah. and Cs is important. And I'm not saying I do. I think I, I, I know how to answer some good questions. And this is why I, I, I had to ask some good questions. And I think this book will help you with that. But on this notion yeah. that Twitter, for instance, is kind of an abuse, are you not giving consideration to the idea that the Constitution needs to be a fluid document that can adapt to technology and whatever exercise of speech technology brings? Because it's only going to get faster and more, pew, right? I think that's right. I mean, to me, the brilliance of the document, uh, both the original Constitution, but also fundamentally when we talk about the Constitution now, we mean the post-Civil War amendments, the end of slavery, of course, the correction of the original sin and evil of the Constitution, and especially the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection under law. Those ideals are flexible. They're designed that way. These people who wrote the uh, Civil War, uh, post-Civil War amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, who wrote the original Bill of Rights guaranteeing free speech and free exercise of religion. They wrote it in a way to be broad enough so that it would be possible to apply it in situations. So the idea of the oath certainly uh, can accommodate the idea that uh, uh, Twitter is going to exist. And it requires a president to speak in a way in support rather than against the Constitution. The First Amendment, uh, whether it's a... Uh, so it's to, not, it's not yeah. the platform, it's what he's saying. It's what he's saying, the content but why, of it. But the platform does what to exacerbate the problem? I think it, uh, the technology makes the dangers uh, increase. So take war, for instance. One of the criticisms in the book is that we've moved away from the original distribution of the war powers. Uh, the, the president certainly is the commander in chief, but it's Congress that has the obligation and the requirement to initiate or declare war. That's what it meant. Uh, now, uh, and we the, haven't the risk done of that, that since. <laughs> Uh, we haven't done that in that formal protocol since World War II? There was a formal declaration there. I mean, in the book I say that a resolution is okay. It doesn't matter if that's the form of, of declaration. But what I do think, or initiation, but what I do think is a problem is a president who thinks that he or she can just initiate a conflict uh, on his or her own, and that one person is making that decision without the permission and go-ahead of, of Congress. That's something that the framers were very clear of. Now, my point about technology is that nuclear weapons make that threat even more extreme in a way the framers couldn't have imagined. But they worried about war even then, and they created a mechanism for that decision. That didn't include one person. It, it required Congress as well. So uh, I think that the mechanisms, the principles are broad enough that they could apply and do apply today. And we ignore them 
at our peril. There was also an assumption that a president would respect the document, and so there are the threat to fire Mueller, for instance, uh, is a stress test on the Constitution. It's got holes in it, and it rests on a president, on all of us, to elect a president who's going to respect the document. Well, it's interesting, because I don't know where we're going to end up. Again, we're a week and a half past the meeting with Rosenstein and the Kavanaugh hearing, and I'm not exactly sure where we are in terms of the real news cycle. Um, but this term, constitutional crisis, is, yes. is, is coming up more and more. Uh, smart constitutional scholars have said that we're either in one or nearing one. Short answer, in one or nearing one? Oh, we're in one. When you have a president who is disregarding the oath um, and threatening to uh, use his office to solely protect himself from a criminal investigation, that's sort of the definition of one. So it's so important for us, we the people, to know what our Constitution is, which is why you ought to, how to interpret it, which is why you ought to take a look at the book and read others. I mean, you know, Corey's book is not the Constitution. It's an interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, I'm sure a good one. But it seems to me that it's not just the president. It's, right. it's members of Congress who have seemed to Absolutely. have stepped away for purposes of operating within the Constitution, namely in this new cycle, the Supreme Court nominations, that that is the tunnel vision mission exclusive and whatever other bumps in the road with the Constitution may exist, be damned. And the last third of the book is about how to stop a president who disregards the oath, who disrespects the Constitution, in a sense a president who brings us to a constitutional crisis. And my point there is it's on the people, it's on Congress uh, when it comes to uh, investigation or impeachment. It's on uh, the Congress also to pass a law to protect the investigation of a president and to, uh, to make clear that an indictment is possible of a president. And it's also on the states. It's on Rhode Island. It's on California to resist unconstitutional action by the federal government in legal ways. And I outline uh, the legal ways of doing that. Hmm. So many questions. One more segment when we come back. So here's the question that I have. You keep you keep coming back to the people mm. uh, because the people are, you know, as we the people. I mean, right. we are, we are part of the living constitution. Who's going to meet out a constitutional crisis? What, what project for me? What do you think with this president or another? What the nature of the acute crisis will be. Is this an indictment situation and say Kavanaugh does, has already been confirmed? Mm. He's in there with, uh, we discussed in the program last week that his, his view is, is highly flavored to executive power. Um, yeah. And he's in there probably to argue no indictments, uh, no what else? I think that he uh, holds a view that uh, if they pass a law to protect Mueller, there's a good chance that he would vote that that law was unconstitutional. Uh, he thinks that a president should be able to control um, all of the prosecutions uh, in the federal government, that it's under him. Uh, so that would heighten the crisis. So ultimately, I guess my answer is that we need to have a referendum in the next presidential election and in the midterms on the Constitution. That has to be the question. Are we going to have public officials who are protecting the rule of law, protecting the precedent in U.S. v. Nixon that says a president is not above the law, and passing legislation to protect a special prosecutor, for instance, or create an independent prosecutor that couldn't be fired without cause? Uh, those are the things that we need to be talking about in these next elections. How do you and ultimately, that's, you know, that's what will determine whether we survive this test or not. How do you separate and define for clear-minded, open-minded citizens, and I still hope there are more than those than not, yeah. the difference between politics and constitutional crisis? Because even the president, you know, has been saying, this is, you know, the Kavanaugh thing, and again, mm -hmm. we're a week and a half behind, new show, but a week and a half behind. You know, this is all politics. Yeah. Well, I never consider politics to be a dirty word. Politics is the fuel yeah. that, that runs the engine called the democracy, seems to me, or the republic, whatever, the government, the constitution. 
people get bogged down in politics being a dirty word. Politicians right. are dirty characters. No East blah, 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 blah. I wonder if we're, we're going to be able to morph to a, a place where constitutional protection becomes a pedestrian theme versus the idea of politics. Do you, you, you yeah, hear what I'm of asking? Yeah. I mean, I think, look, there are some issues that are really the Constitution silent about. Uh, should we have universal health care or should we have no Obamacare? Those are not issues that the Constitution really opines on our economic questions. Nor are those the issues that caused you to write this book. No, those are partisan issues and we should debate them in, in politics in the normal course of things. But what this is about is a different kind of, of limit. It's about the limit of the rule of law. It's about the uh, outline within which uh, politics, partisan politics, is allowed to happen. And uh, some of these things are supposed to be so firm in the Bill of Rights, not discriminating based on race, not uh, limiting free speech, not discriminating based on religion. Uh, that's what Washington was trying to do, I think, in that second inaugural address when he said, uh, subject me to constitutional punishment if I disregard the oath, to say that apart from the normal course of politics, there is a foundation in the rule of law that all presidents, all parties have to respect. So when uh, the second uh, President Bush, for instance, after 9-11 said Islam is a religion of peace, what he was trying to do was to say, look, there are certain principles that all of us, regardless of party, have to buy into. And that's what the book is really about, the outlines and protections and our rights that, uh, regardless of party, we are all obligated to respect. Are you worried that, and maybe this is another reason for the book, are you worried that the general population is just not smart enough about this stuff? Look, this book is written in such simple terms. Uh, it's written so that a, a, a senior in high school could read it. I uh, gave a lecture uh, shortly after our show at uh, Ridgewood High School in Ridgewood, New Jersey, where I moved after I, I grew up in Queens, moved out there later on. And those students got it instantly. Uh, people, if they want to pay attention, they want to learn, they could read this book. It's written in simple language but with the lots of stories the and book, history. The book aside, the book is a must read. But, yeah. but the just principles are simple. President is not above the law. My 11-year-old understands it. Donald Trump doesn't because he doesn't have the desire or patience. But I, I think an 11-year-old can. <laughs> no, I, I just find it fascinating that that you saw this freight train coming during the campaign. Yes. The disposition has been transparent the entire way. Yes. And people were so earnest for change that they disregarded these things. And, and now we've got some problems. And you know, I to me, the, I go back to those original discussions because I think you and I both saw the freight train. We were both on the same page. And my guess is, although we focus our conversations on the Constitution and partisan politics, my guess is we'd have disagreements. But our agreement, our underlying agreement that you and I, when we're taking calls or doing this show, what we're trying to do is to lay out the foundation of American democracy and to say, regardless of party, these are the ideas that everyone, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, everyone has to buy into. All right. Uh, again, the book is called The Oath and the Office, and it's available wherever good books are sold. Worth a read. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for suggesting it. Final word and leaving the back. Stay with us. Although the presidency of Donald Trump has inspired some of the thinking of writing this book that Mr. Bre uh, Professor Brett Schneider has put together here, uh, don't make the mistake of seeing this as a partisan conversation. There are things that I think. Trump supporters and non-supporters have got to agree upon, and that is that the Constitution is being incredibly tested right now. Read the book and, uh, you know, do your own evaluation. But know that protecting the Constitution is something that is really our collective responsibility. Right? I'll see you on the radio on Monday, 3 to 6 on WPRO and whatever other day uh, the show proceeds. See ya.